Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to this webinar on digital extension initiatives within CGIAR. We're super, super excited to see all of you logging on right now. Um, and before we even get started, I just want to make sure that you all can see us and hear us OK. So if you can see us and hear us OK, please do type in the chat um, so that we know that the audio and visual is working well. Um, but in the meantime, it's great to see people joining us from all parts of the world um, and already seeing people chat and excitedly asking about the webinar start time. So that's awesome. Um, in terms of the format for today, we're going to have Daniel, um, who's going to introduce a bit more about the topic for the webinar from the community of the practice team. And then we're going to also just launch into the wide range of speakers we have represented today. So Daniel, I'm going to turn it over to you to do the introduction. OK, good. Thank you. So thank you for joining today. My name is Daniel Jimenez. I'm the leader of this community of practice on data-driven agronomy. And I'm very pleased to see you all attending on our Wednesday night, already Thursday, <laughs> Thursday for, for some of our speakers and some of the other attendees. Uh, so one of the objectives of this community of practice on data-driven agronomy is to communicate collective action and collective knowledge on a particular topic. Uh, across the CGIR and also uh, across the, the partners of the big data platform in agriculture. And that is precisely what we want to do today, uh, bringing virtual researchers from the CGIR and um, to, to listen to them and share their ongoing work on digital extension in the different geographies. So digital extension is a topic that I personally feel very excited about because you probably don't know, but become, before I became a scientist, I used to work as extension officer in a developing country like Colombia. And uh, I, um, in the country, uh, I, I used to face like two main challenges. One of them was the number of farms that I could reach uh, in, 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 in the country, in the rural, in the rural areas where sometimes there are no roads. There were no roads. So sometimes by walking, it took me like two hours to get one farm. So it was very difficult to, to reach farmers when we didn't have the technology and, and the resources. The second challenge was the lack of accuracy of the recommendations that I was providing to farmers. And it was basically because they were based on techniques developed in totally different, uh, not only biophysical, but socio socioeconomic circumstances. So if we, take it, if we take a look at the information and the techniques that are available today, uh, we can, for example, access to climate information through a G just with a simple GPS coordinate, and also to soil information from, from uh, digital soil mapping and climate from, sat from satellites, sorry. So this is totally changing the landscape of agronomy. In the same way, how can we determine the the, or differentiate, differentiate the, the, the nutrient deficiency from a pest or disease using uh, multispectral or hyperspectral images. In that case, sometimes those machines, those algorithms can do better than, than the human, than the human eye to differentiate, differentiate between a pest and disease or a nutrient deficiency. So um, it kind of confirms that what I suspected many years ago, that now we can provide farmers with more timely site specific and high, high quality information. Um, so we want to keep moving forward this topic on digital extension. It doesn't end with this webinar. We want to take these discussions out of the CGIR too. And we'll be very happy to facilitate the development of this topic, in blogs, papers, and to develop new collaborative opportunities, proje projects and products, why not? That can contribute to the acceleration of this uh, research and development on, on digital extension. So I think that's it. That's my what I, what, what I wanted to say. Now uh, we will move again to, to setting up. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that introduction on digital extension services and why this is an important topic um, for everyone today. Um, so we do have an exciting lineup of speakers. We have Sheetal Sharma from Erie. We have Rowena Castillo as well, who's representing Erie. And we also have Srikant Ruba Fatram um, from Ikrisat, as well as Ram Dilipala from Ikrisat. And last but not the least, Timothy Krapnik from Simit. 
Um, and all our wonderful speakers will be talking about the various groundbreaking initiatives on digital extension that are happening across the CGIAR community. So Sheetal, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce yourself and your team and then launch into your presentation. And the order will be Sheetal and Rowena Srikanth and Ram, and then finally Tim, and we'll leave time at the end for question and answer service um, sessions. So if anyone has any questions, please be sure to type them up in the chat and we will um, make sure that we can respond at the end. Thank you, everybody. So Sheetal, um, I'm turning it over to you now. A very good morning to everyone and thank you for logging in. Uh, I'm really looking forward to not only the question and answers coming, but also to other speakers. I'm Sheetal Sharma and I work with International Rice Research Institute as a soil scientist. Uh, I have been involved in developing site-specific nutrient management recommendations and the challenge that we faced was how we are going to take these to the farmers. For me, digital extension is one of the tools which can help in bringing this uh, science that we develop at our farms to the farms of the farmers. It, it brings easy access to the information, uh, independent of physical contact with the already existing public and private extension services. I feel that extension uh, can be digitized and it can help in bringing relevant information to the farmers at the time when it is required and it's in a more actionable form. Um, I will start my presentation now. Great. I Looks hope good. you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So I will be presenting a tool which has been developed uh, in Erie in partnership with various national and international organizations, CG centers. Uh, the tool is called Rice Crop Manager, and what it does, it, it brings field-specific crop management options, especially for the smallholder farmers of South Asia and Southeast Asia. Talking about the smallholder farmers of these areas, what are the issues that these farmers are facing? The major issue over here is that they have very small farms which are fragmented and highly variable variable in terms of the soil, in terms of how they manage it, even how uh, the time of transplanting, time of establishment of the crop. Uh, and often farmers are seen that they are applying fertilizers inefficiently uh, with respect not only to the amount, but the time of application. Coupled with the stress uh, that we see nowadays due to climate change, which includes uncertainty in water availability has coupled the problem and thus leads to low agronomic use efficiencies. What can we do about it? So we, what we need is an appropriate nutrient and crop management options, which could help to maximize the farmer's investment on it, the fertilizers and also on other inputs. Rice crop manager, is an ICT-based tool which is grounded in the principles of SSNM. There is a dynamically adjusted target yield which helps to address the variability among the fields with respect to soil, variety, management, etc. What it does is it provides nutrient and crop management recommendation which is actionable and make it easy to use by the farmers. It provides the right timing, source, and amount of fertilizers for the field size, which is which uh, which correlates with the farmer's field size. It also has a flexibility of providing recommendations for stress conditions, for example, submergence and drought, and it is customized for different countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia, Philippines, and different states of India. How it is developed? As I already informed you, it is grounded on the principles of site-specific nutrient management. So we initiate by collecting the local data, which includes the agronomic databases from multiple locations and under diverse conditions. 
we collect data on attainable yield, yield responses to various nutrients, calculate the fertilizer use efficiencies in those areas, agronomic efficiencies, the nutrient uptake data, and then we develop a model. We do the data analysis. We also do a lot of consultation meetings with the national partners, other CG members, and uh, also even the policy makers. Uh, the algorithms are developed and the decision trees for crop management are developed. All these are then programmed to develop the beta version of the tool. Once the beta version is developed, we take it to the field for validation and we evaluate it against the existing farmer's practice, but also the blanket recommendations which uh, already exist or the earlier uh, recommendations that exist to see what benefit a field-specific recommendation can bring uh, in terms of uh, reducing the fertilizer use or increasing the yield with optimizing the fertilizer use. Once the field testing is done, this also helps us to adjust the model and then we release it for the dissemination for various countries. How it works? Uh, we interview the farmer using a mobile phone, a tab, or a laptop. It can be accessed through the browser. The interview can be done offline or online using a set of 10 to 15 questions. Uh, once the interview is done, we submit the, the answers to the cloud-based server. And this server includes two models. One is the nutrient management calculator, which are the algorithms which have been developed, and the decision-making calculator for crop management. In, in addition to that, it also houses databases and spatial information on variety traits, location-specific soil information, variety and management, and climate-adjusted yield targets. Once this information is sent to the cloud-based server, um, within a few seconds, the recommendation is generated as a one-page output. This page includes a pictorial diagram for that particular variety which the farmer is using for that particular farm size. It also gives a timing and amount of application that the farmer has to apply and also some crop management practices which are customized for the farmer's management practice. For example, a direct seeded crop will get information only for the direct seeding um, and weed management associated with the direct seeded rice, while the, trans the farmers who are taking transplanting will get information on nursery management, etc. These uh, recommendations or the information generated from the rice crop manager can be uh, used to provide customized reports. For example, we can link it with the soil health portals, we can print, uh, provide it as a printed guidelines, but we can also send it through SMS and voice calls. There is also a potential to add a lot of other tools, and my colleague uh, in a later part of the presentation will talk more about it. One of the major things of uh, advantage of Rice Crop Manager, it is cloud-based and thus it has an opportunity to interface with various other data sets. For example, the climate data, the remote sensing data, or the geospatial data which, has, which is being created now. These are some of the illustrative results from South Asia, mainly from uh, Orissa and uh, Bihar and Eastern UP in India and Bangladesh. Uh, when we did these on-farm trials and we evaluated the recommendations generated from rice crop manager against the existing farmer's practice, we could see that there was an advantage of uh, around 0.5 to 0.8 ton per hectare per season in dry seas and a net added benefit of 100 to 155 for uh, with the use of uh, crop management, uh, crop manager recommendations. In addition to that, also in wheat, there was a yield advantage of 0.3 ton per hectare and a net added benefit of 63 uh, USD per hectare. Similarly, in Bangladesh, we found that there was a grain yield of 0.4 ton per hectare per season with a net added benefit ranging from 100 to 150 USD per hectare per season. We are now in a process of taking the rice crop manager recommendations to the farmers. And in that process, we are kind of evaluating what 
uh, two years. We are using various channels to deploy it, and one of the uh, key partners for this is the existing extension services, the physical ex extension services, which include the Department of Agriculture. Um, they have large human resources, and uh, they can help us in interviewing the farmer or providing the information, taking the recommendations to them. The lim major limitation of using these physical uh, extension services at that most of the time they consider it as an extra load and to the existing responsibilities and it's until and unless it's a part of their program or schedule it's difficult to motivate them to use the digital services uh, we are also use, uh, working with a number of ngos at the grassroots level uh, the major strength is that they are closely associated with the farmers and have the capacity to mobilize and motivate to try and adopt a new technology because they are from the farmers itself. They are very close to the farmers. The major limitation is again that usually they work within the span of the projects that we engage with them. Um, they're not technically sound, so we have to go for um, frequent trainings with them and a rigorous monitoring is required but we we still feel that if we encourage them and if we see if they see the benefit of using these digital tools uh, they are happy to include them in their own uh, programs uh, they are also a key to include the self help groups progressive farmers and rural roots in developing entrepreneurship around uh, digital uh, extension services. Agro advisory services. Now, because we had an issue of like, uh, though we do have a physical force on ground, but still we need channels to push the recommendations to the farmer in more efficient and timely manner. So what we did was we are working with various organizations, including, including Precision Agriculture Development, IFCO, uh, Kisan Sanchar Limited, and they are helping us in converting these recommendations into SMS and voice calls and then transferring it to the farmers as and when the time of application of a particular management comes. The major limitation is that most of the farmers, they frequently change their contact numbers. And if we do a voice call, there is a limited attention span for the farmers. However, we still feel that using the services, um, even to interview the farmers, can help in decreasing the human interface in the whole process, and also uh, help in generating more recommendations and better advisories can be sent to the farmers. We are also trying to integrate it with already existing government schemes. So that helps in uh, developing a sustainable plan for the tools. Uh, the limitation is that initially it requires rigorous monitoring and we need to ensure proper delivery. Uh, we also need to ensure timely start of activities. Now these programs um, have a lot of other things that need to be done. So we have to be very much linked with them initially. But there is an opportunity to integrate these tools into the Department of Agriculture mandate so that they are sustainable and can be taken forward when our engagement with them ends. There are also different missions that are existing. For example, there is an Odisha Livelihood uh, mission. Though they are more aligned to organic farming, but they are happy to expand their uh, the opportunity to larger areas and also to include tools and services. It's okay now? Yeah, so you're breaking up a little bit, um, but we caught a little of what you're saying. So if you can just summarize um, the last few sentences, that'll be great. Okay, so fine, thank you. So uh, the common service centers, these are the digital centers and they work on business models. So it is also one way where sustainability can be there. Now these business models currently, uh, we are providing them training and kind of engaging them. But in the long run, we feel that if these develop, this can be a good business model to uh, sustain and take these tools to the farmers. Also looking at the input dealers. These are uh, the 
the people to whom farmers usually contact for any kind of information so whenever they go to buy inputs they ask like what should we do if we are able to train these input dealers in providing relevant context specific information to the farmers that could be a good achievement for us this can also be then developed as a business model where they charge for the information along with uh, the inputs that they are providing uh we have been thinking of like what can help to make rice crop manager more adoptable and also scalable uh what we think is that it is a continuous project uh, process and because being digital it is easy for us to um make it more dynamic but we also need research that has to uh, take into consideration the present conditions for example the stresses that are coming the disease and pests everything has to be considered so we need a continuous modification and refinement of the algorithms for changing the agricultural practices we need to develop algorithms and frameworks to cater for temporal and spatial variation especially if we talk about the rainfed environment and we need to make the tools more holistic and dynamic where they deal with the additional information <laughs> so we are looking <laughs> at oh partnership and we also need the framework to be more automated uh, for yield targeting thus to decrease the human error and increase the accuracy we are also uh, i would like to highlight some of the challenges that we are facing in our initial programs that we are doing so one of the key challenges is the limited internet connectivity in the villages limited use of smartphones by the farmers non availability of printing facilities which affects the recommendation delivery then there is a lack of motivation among the department of agriculture staff provision of recommendation at door step is time and resource consuming process so we are also looking at the various ways where we can reduce this and the behavioral change is still not easy but i think that can be worked out what we need to do is to identify most efficient dissemination pathways we are also working to work on offline modules decrease the time of interview make uh, i will now uh, shift the presentation uh, for to my colleague Rovina Casillo and she will share the Philippines experience with you. Uh going over to you. Hi, hello. Good morning. Um so I will be presenting the experiences in the Philippines with the rice crop manager. So the rice crop manager in the Philippines is actually with a partnership with the Department of Agriculture. basically the department of agriculture or the da is funding the uh this project activity of rcm and um it funds two activities the research which is aimed to um improve the the rcm through field evaluation and continued establishment of the nutrient omission plot trials with the philippine rice research institute and the other part of the project activity is the dissemination which is to ensure that this rcm technology is reaching farmers and we are collaborating more with the department of agriculture regional field offices and they partner with the local government units now um similar to india we are um using the um existing extension service from the local government units to facilitate the dissemination and deployment of this rice crop manager shital can you move to the next slide okay so uh, again similar with the india and bangladesh experience as, as what uh, shital presented um with the farm uh, with the field evaluation of rice crop manager we get also um yield increases with the use of rcm so from the 915 on from trials the average yield increase is uh 397 kg per hectare per crop and that's um equivalent to more than 100 um us dollars per hectare as an added net benefit but uh, um the, the the table shows you that 
um, the benefit from RCM is really uh, big when the farmer's yield is equal or below four. So that's just something that um, we, this technology can benefit more this group of farmers and we should be targeting these farmers to have great impact of this rice crop manager. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. Next slide, Shikai. The yeah. slides are moving there. Yeah. Okay. So, can you go back to the? I can't. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this one. So, uh, what I presented earlier is the result of the on-farm research. Um, with the large-scale dissemination uh, since 2013, there were more than 1.8 million RCM recommendations generated already. So this kind of digital extension really um, reach farmers fast and at scale. With that large scale dissemination, we had the monitoring evaluation and learning activity, um, monitoring farmers after harvest with um, cropping uh, within September 2017 to March 2018. Uh, there are more than 1,000 farmers who were given or uh, who were uh, randomly selected for this monitoring activity. And the objective was to determine the uptake of RCM recommendation. So there, there was 27% uh, farmers uptake of the RCM recommendation. So if I, uh, that, for, that RCM recommendation includes the fertilizer management plus other crop management practices. For the nutrient management alone, there was 25% uptake of um, farmers. And with that, if RCM was used, the benefit from um, following the nutrient management, there was an increase of 0.9 tons 0.9 ton per hectare, equivalent to around 400 uh, US dollars added net benefit. There was also an increase in yield if the nutrient management is not followed by the farmers, but it's just 0.2 tons per hectare. So there's a difference of 0.7 in that case. Okay. So we also look at um, the factors affecting the uptake of farmers. And um, the uptake of farmers are really linked with the access to other rice-related services. So if the farmers are getting other um, information regarding rice farming, then it's more likely that they will um, follow the RCM recommendation. Access to loan because um, fertilizers in the Philippines is very costly. So in those areas where the farmers are getting low yield, it's because their fertilizer application is also low. So with the recommendation of RCM, um, there's more fertilizer uh, recommendation. So if they have access to loan or they have access to, to um, financial um, help for purchasing fertilizer, then they can uh, uptake the RCM recommendation. And they also uptake the RCM if they see huge benefit, like if they have low yields before and then they get high yields um, after that, then the uptake of the RCM can uh, be encouraged. Also, the availability of pump, it means the irrigation is, uh, oh, is fine. And of course, the number of the agricultural extension workers that's involved in the RCM. Now with the sustainability plan uh, to for, for this RCM in the Philippines, um, we still work with the DA and, uh, and this um, process will be more of involving a lot of agencies under the Department of Agriculture, but then the main um, point for dissemination is still the local government units. And okay, next. 
Yes. So we have this project management team that's steering the activities of the rice crop manager within the DA, um, different organizations within the DA plus ERI. Okay, next. Yeah, and um, aside from that, we have the technical working groups. And we are now in the transition phase of RCM um, from being a project to a program for the Department of Agriculture. So this year to next year, we will do a lot of capacity building, um, upgrading of the IT infrastructure, pair programming for ERI and the Department of Agriculture so they can do that after the turn turnover in 2021 they can do that themselves already so with just minimal um assistance or help from erie awesome thanks so much Irena. so we're actually um running a bit short on time so if we can probably um get to the key lessons learned awesome yeah so Thank the you. key lessons learned um from from our experience here in the philippines is we should have a right partners in the large scale dissemination um, we should know what they want in the decisions. Um, we, we need um, national champions or individuals who can really connect and mobilize the key partners to do the, the deployment of this technology. In terms of the governance, um, it has to be within the budget and responsibilities of the extension service. There has to be a support on that. And there should be a continued research and um, development for the upgrading of the application because of the um, variabilities or adjustments that we need to do uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rina and Shita, for um, your presentation. Okay. Um, so right now, we actually have um, Srikanth and Ram who are talking about using artificial intelligence to diagnose plant health. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Srikanth and Ram. So are you able to see the screen that I'm about to share. Mm -hmm. So it's currently being shared. Okay. So, so this is my topic using artificial intelligence to diagnose plant health. So we had an MOU with Pete, a German startup company that worked on artificial intelligence. And this was way back in September 2016. We also have other partners who are working with us in the development of this tool. The local state agriculture university, uh, the department of agriculture, and other schemes within the government who were supporting us. So if you can see differences between the two leaves there with our eyes, and we know there is something wrong on the one on the left, then the computer is able to do the same thing using deep neural networks and using machine learning techniques. Python software is the backend with which the app, the Android app, Plantix works. It is a very simple process. All that a user has to do after downloading this app from the Google Play Store is to open it and it automatically operates two things. One is the geolocations are, and the camera image processing is done simultaneously. When somebody takes an image, it is uploaded online. And this image is then processed and, and, and a detection of that processed image is sent back to the user within a couple of seconds, depending on the speed of the mobile uh, either using mobile data or Wi-Fi access. So what happens to the user is after they receive this detection of their disease or a pest or a nutrient deficiency, uh, the recommendations that follow are also given to manage that disease. So one unique, unique feature of this app is identifying, but when we started there were only few diseases and pests that the app was able to identify when the proof of concept stage passed on, was passed on to us. Then uh, the problem we faced when we went to the fields and tried to introduce this to the farmers, we learned that 
if a user is not happy, they may not come back to use this tool again. So the major challenge for us was to keep them satisfied by starting something called a community service, wherein if the answer is not received by the user or the user is not satisfied, the user can then put that image and write the question in the community. So we had employed few experts uh, and they used to answer them back within one day time. So that was one feature that was introduced based on the feedback that we got from the farmers. Then the farmers were asking for weather because we work in the semi-arid tropics and uh, weather was an important aspect for doing agriculture here. So uh, the team was like, they were doing sprints fast enough to include the weather tab where uh, five day forecast was given based on the geo location of the user. And uh, later on, based on the feedbacks from the farmers, actually, uh, we, we came to a stage where we could identify that uh, some farmers were interested to have a crop calendar or a crop guide. Like if I am a user and I'm a farmer, if I give the name of my crop and the date when I have sown my crop, then it would initiate push notifications and help the farmer during the whole season. So uh, these, these advisories are very targeted and the user will get uh, very specific information because they have given us this information on their crop and the sowing date. So this feature is also embedded right now in Plantix app. But there are some real things happening behind because we talk, just talked about the front end, what was happening in terms of a user using uh, artificial intelligence to identify uh, these plant damages. There are many threads happening behind. One of them is on the top left side is GatherX. It is another app which we use to gather all the damage symptoms to build training data sets for individual pests and diseases. Sometimes we need up to 4,000 uh, varied from varied location with lot lot of variability because the the Pest and diseases have a cycle where uh, it is not the same symptom appearing the same way. So all this variation is gathered and we use this tool GatherX uh, with our picture hunters, the feet on ground, and also uh, through the government uh, staff. We have engaged them actively in developing the data sets here in India. Then we, we call some, there's something called Meerkat on, on the left hand side, bottom. Uh, it, th this is a tool that is used online by experts like pathology, plant pathologists or entomologists or uh, soil scientists, um, wherein they tag individual pictures to the specific disease or the same based on the image. So a lot of filtering is done while preparing these data sets. This is the real speed work after gathering the uh, images, uh, they have to be tagged to a particular uh, pest or a disease. Then, uh, these tools, other tools like Dingo. Dingo is for our content. I'll tell you the real challenge we faced was also on content because uh, the, the content had, had to be vetted by universities and then later translated into uh, local languages. We have done it for about eight local languages. So uh, especially the terminologies on using the names of the pests and diseases uh, vary widely within the same language. Uh, so that, that was the biggest challenge we faced and Dingo helps us to actually uh, neutralize them and edit and work back. Uh, then Albatross, uh, if you see that is one tool that we are using to uh, showcase a dashboard uh, which will help in decision making. And Ape, Ape is a API given for uh, companies or other interested users of this data that is being generated by after Plantix has been deployed by a user. And Phoenix is helping uh, artificial intelligence, in fact, using the threads, like if there is a common um, a question that was asked earlier, uh, it is now automated if somebody uh, asked the same question for the same crop, so the answer that was already existing will be pop popping out to the, uh, to, to the person who is asking this question in the co community. So that is also now in beta phase, and. Uh, uh, it, it, it will be trialed this season, the Phoenix part. What are the business models? This, this app is actually free for the user. 
end user. So Plantix is not chargeable anywhere in the world. So they have uh, different channels. One is the API that they are they have planned and also uh, a couple of companies started using it. Um, uh, the input companies, big input companies, because this will be additional service that these companies are using for their own customers, for retain, retaining them and giving a service to the uh, farmer. Then data in, insights. This is something that uh, the team is still working on because there could be some prediction modeling modeling methods that will be used to predict actually the pests and diseases so that those who are in the ecosystem, there will be people who will be in, interested in these insights uh, apart from the B2B and C uh, channels. Uh, they are uh, in the process of uh, initiating directly uh, enabling, um, uh, I mean, after a detection is made at the farmer's end to use that as a lead for an input seller to help the farmer to reach out to them and for the input seller to reach out to the farmers. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we face and we are still facing is the preparation of these data sets that we get from different sources, the training data sets, which I mean. And uh, every time a new pest or a disease is added, the algorithm has to be modified. So this is the biggest challenge at the back end. And while preparing and collecting these uh, individual uh, plant damage symptoms from all over India, in fact, our field staff, um, then we involved the Department of Agriculture, who are also helping us at some, I mean, in in couple of states to gather these uh, plant damage symptoms. So I already spoke to you about uh, the uh, the the filtering that is happening by with the tagging of individual images. This is some. This is one of the snapshot of the the how it appears to an expert and how they uh, tag the individual images for preparing a data set for training the algorithms. Uh, I, 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 we just can peep into what is happening here. If you have a, for example, uh, on the left hand side, this is, we know it's a bland, brown plant hopper on rice, but when an image is taken so closely, uh, I mean, this is the challenge for uh, the back end to actually solve it. Actually identifying it as rice itself is a biggest challenge. While we can easily say those who are working in rice that this is brown, this is a hopper, but identifying the uh, plant itself. So these are different heat maps that are generated with the algorithms and how the machine is able to, you know, predict what it is after actually identifying the plant and then what what is the symptom it is all about. So these are different things happening at the back end before actually we get an answer. And uh, one, uh, as I already said, this is one of the biggest challenges, the language part and uh, getting the uh, all the translations perfect so we try uh, i mean most of the work is outsourced with professional people but getting agriculture background experts for translation has been a challenge because in agriculture the control measures the biological um, uh, control measures the symptom expression people use the technical uh, jargon is slightly different from the regular uh, language uh, here is a snapshot of the decision support system uh, i will take you uh, to the place where we can actually uh, see uh, online. So this is how the albatross looks for one particular state. I'm giving you as an example. This is the state of Andhra Pradesh. So on the right hand side, I have the districts. And just above that, on the right hand side, uh, I can choose the crops. Say, for example, if I choose rice, I get the heat map of uh, only those which were posted on the crop rice. And here on the top, I have a timeline with the histogram showing the number of uh, images that were sourced during the last one year. And if you see, typically, we have the growing season. Uh, I mean, very clearly the Kharif season where we get a lot of images. And we can actually see the list of diseases and pests for example, I take bacterial blight of rice that was reported. So we get to know exactly the locations where, from where the images have come. And then we can drill down uh, directly into, you know, the exact location. In fact, the field in our Google Maps from where this 
uh, the user has sent the image. So this data, because of the GPS location and the timestamp, this can be very useful for doing some modeling work when we combine it with weather data and soil data and do some modeling to actually predict pests and diseases in the future. So we have about four uh, uh, years, four season data actually at the moment. And the same way, uh, we have we have the data on a um, in a way that we can actually have a look into. Sorry for this. Uh, we could actually drill down and see the data in Google Analytics. Uh, where do we get this data from around the world? Not just India, but from around the world. So we have this uh, pooled up data, states wise, crop wise, and even on a map, we can actually go and see from where we are getting this data. So. And here, I'll be ending it up soon. We have a, a real-time uh, monitoring of uh, fall army worm. That was a recent invasive pest that was introduced in Ju July uh, last year. So right now, we actually uh, trace it and track its movements uh, online. And it is available at plantix.net for anybody to see this. We could, it, is, it was possible because of the presence of different development projects of ICRISAT. And CABI and CIMIT has also contributed uh, in getting some images from the field. The adoption strategy, uh, we believe that uh, the public-private partnership is the way forward. Uh, and uh, we have, from the beginning, uh, included uh, the government. On the right side is the Prime Minister of India, who happened to give us time to see the to look at the demonstration and its usefulness on the right side bottom you have the chief minister of one of the state launching and of course uh, many many uh, training programs conducted on the left hand side you see the extension workers of the department of agriculture actually they all have a tablet uh, so it was very easy for us to take this forward uh, through the uh, partnerships of icrisat like through the governments and the ngos and the university so what is the insight that that is possible? Uh, for example, using evap evapotranspiration of the last year, uh, we have they have modeled to see whether there is a link between the disease and evapotranspiration. And it is very interesting that there is a lot of correlation between both. And things like this have, are still in infancy, but uh, we are going to soon do some uh, do a hackathon actually here and involve other players to give us ideas on actually uh, utilizing this data sets. So uh, this app presently having more than 10 million uh, uh, plant damages and about they have almost reached 6 million downloads. And I will hand this over to Ram. Ram, can you, oh, yeah, can, yeah. Can, you can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Ram. OK, so I think I just have about five minutes, right? Uh, Srikant, can you just continue the slide deck, please? Oh, yeah. OK. OK. OK, very quickly. So I won't take more than five minutes, uh, 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 five minutes, uh, uh, Mariam and uh, Sedi. OK, so this is, I just want to speak about another uh, digital extension initiative that uh, we have at Icrisat. You just heard uh, Srikant speaking about Plantix, where the input to the app is a picture, right? Uh, this is another tool which ICRISAT developed collaboratively with uh, Microsoft. Uh, it's called ISAT. It expands for Intelligent Systems Advisory Tool, right? So if you look at the picture, you see uh, this uh, tool that we developed collaboratively with Microsoft uh, was basically, you know, Srikant, so you can stay on the earlier slide. It was collaboratively developed uh, in consultation uh, with uh, farmers, right? So what we tried to do was, uh, you know, we tried to, we had, uh, the historical weather data sets available for a location in a district called Anantapur in Andhra Pradesh. So what we did was we tried to characterize uh, based on some deep analytics of that historical data. We tried to characterize uh, the you know uh, the drivers and the triggers and trends etc. We so we did a lot of deep analytics to identify various uh, uh, you know trigger points etc. What we also did was we also did extensive extensive farmer group discussions. Uh, kind of combined, synthesized all these different data 
uh, and kind of built what is called as decision trees. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Srikant? Yeah. So these, so this, if you look at this, you know, this is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, an, an output of some of the analytics based on the focus group discussions that we had. Uh, and uh, you can go to the next slide, Srikant, straight away. Yeah. So this is another example of a kind of an analytics we did. See, if you see, for instance, this data, you know, an analysis of the historical uh, weather data sets, what it tells you is you can basically conclude that uh, in an year when the average rainfall in the in that particular location was 300 millimeters or more, the likelihood of more than four spells of dry you know dry spells was lower or something like that so based on these are some examples of the kind of analytics we did can you go to the next one and finally all these the all the data that was synthesized based out of these analytics were basically used to create this kind of a decision tree right for instance what does this decision tree tell you that it tells you that if the long term forecast is predicted to be greater than 350 millimeters the typical decision the farmer uh, you know uh, the decision to the farmer has to be that they need to plant groundnut with pigeon peas intercrop uh, so this kind of you can go to the next one yeah so basically what we did was basically uh, 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 we kind of analyzed a lot of analytics and you know undertook a lot of deep analytics and created these kinds of extensive decision trees which would basically consider as input the cumulative rainfall uh, that that location has received until date uh, also you know at the same time it considers as input uh, the seasonal weather forecast and the weather outlooks as well all these different data points go as input into a small application that was deployed on the microsoft azure cloud and this uh, azure cloud basically has i mean that application did nothing but encoded this decision tree into a simple application and this application was basically then generating very contextualized and very localized uh, advisories these advisories were then in turn uh, you know uh, sent to the farmer via sms you can go to the next slide yeah so these are some results basically that we were able to achieve uh, i won't go much into detail but generally you know overall uh, the reception of uh, this kind of very targeted very contextualized advisory services was very positive in general we also noticed uh, between the control group and between the you know the uh, the group that received these advisories definitely there was uh, an impact in terms of the yield or in terms of their income etc so i'll kind of pause there uh, i think i'm almost at the top of the hour Thank you so much, Ram. Um, thanks as well, Srikant. That was very, very insightful talking through how machine learning can be applied. Um, so Tim, we actually um, are going to turn it over to you now um, to go over your presentation thank and you. talk about Simit's work in digital extension as well. So thanks very much. And I'll try to be relatively fast as we go. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the, the well, Big Data Platform and the Community of Practice for inviting this very useful and timely presentation. I think it's great that we're all sharing ideas on this topic because it's a, a quite new area, I think, in many ways for the CGIAR, and we have a lot that we can learn from each other and also, also through our, our, our work with our partners. So what I will do in this presentation is briefly talk through some work that we're doing um, in Simit, and much of the focus that I'll present is on Bangladesh. And I'll talk about uh, work that we've done in rural video campaigns to reach farmers at a large scale. And this is sort of a, a mature digital extension approach that we are, are utilizing. Um, and then I'll talk about things that we have under development, which is different than the last two presentations from colleagues at ICRASAT and at ERI. But we wanted to show you things that we're, we're actively working on now and struggling with in some ways and trying to find our path forward and understand how, how we want to deploy um, the, the tools and techniques that we're working on through digital extension um, with the goal of getting feedback from anybody who might be, be listening or colleagues that are on the call. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, a new project <clears throat> that we're just starting on pushing and pulling big data for climate smart agricultural advisories. And then I'll reflect at the end a little bit on extension and digital extension in the CGIAR. Um, so as I mentioned first, um, I wanted to talk about our use with, with videos and reaching farmers at scale with better bet agronomy messages. Um, the key point that I want to drive home here is that I think old 
can be gold, uh, to use a, a proverbial statement. A lot of people think about um, digital extension as using mobile phone apps, tablets, computers, smart algorithms, and things that can be utilized. And all of that, I think, is wonderful and very useful. But also for farmers, just seeing new technologies and practices um, being deployed can be also very useful for convincing them that things can be, be um, of value. And so for a number of years, we've worked quite a lot on um, filming um, uh, short um, 10 to 20 minute uh, films uh, with farmers on particular technologies like conservation agriculture or different types of agricultural machinery. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Erie on healthy rice seedling techniques and so on. And some of these films we actually film also in ways that are sort of Bollywood style fun dramas um, where it's not just a deployment of information but tells a funny story about a farmer trying a new technique for example who can't uh, make enough money from their farm now to for example win um, win the heart of a, of a young girl in the village and get her father's approval for marriage for example and then he tries a new technique um, and is able to raise income or becomes a rural business person and then sort of wins the girl um, in, in a way that is fun and that farmers can relate to. And we, we work with an NGO called Agricultural Advisory Society and we set up in rural areas and in marketplaces in evenings, we set up large screen video shows with PowerPoint uh, sort of set up. And we've had over the few years over 350,000 farmers watching videos this way. And if you set something like this up in a rural area, it pretty much instantaneously generates a large crowd of people who are curious. You get a lot of people watching, not everyone farmers, but if you put them in the right place, you can get farmers watching. And that we've found in many cases, depending on the technology that's being presented in the videos, there can be quite strong, sometimes up to 50% adoption and use rate. And it's also very cost effective. Um, you reach a lot of farmers this way. Um, when you also consider the cost of production and the cost of actually doing rural video shows. What's really important about this also is that it offers a forum for question and answer. So after we do the video shows, almost always farmers will have questions and so we, with a microphone and sound boxes, have skilled people who are able to answer technical questions and we have facilitated discussions that go and forth between farmers and uh, those who are showing the videos. This work we do through the CISA project um, in Bangladesh uh, with the support of USAID and the Gates Foundation. Um, again, it's not the perhaps sexiest, most interesting app-driven, uh, internet-driven approach to digital extension, but I think still is highly relevant and can be very effective. Awesome. So Tim, um, um, we actually can't see your slides yet if you are screen sharing. Uh -huh. So I'm just gonna make sure that you're sharing your screen. Um, that would be my fault. No worries at all. You're good. <laughs> so it, it, very ironic that we're talking about digital extension and that I, I forget to, to press screen share while doing a presentation. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's, that's just what I was talking about in the work that we do with, with videos. Um, moving forward, um, I want to talk about some products that we have under development. And this is interesting and it differs from the work, for example, that colleagues at ICRASAT just showed which, uh, with Plantix and the detection of diseases once they are present in the field. But we are doing work also here on forecasting diseases that can, can be a problem so we can give early alerts to farmers with respect to taking preventative control actions and measures. And one, one way that we're doing that, we're working now on wheat blast disease, which had a sudden appearance in Bangladesh in 2016, uh, affected quite a large area of Bangladesh. Um, it, it, the Ministry of Agriculture in Bangladesh was initially actually quite angry initially with, with CIMIT and sort of said, we have this massive disease problem. We need very quickly resistant varieties to fix it. We need monitoring systems. We need warning systems for farmers. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to help us? And so we, we took on this, this challenge working with um, the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute and the um, Wheat and Maize Research Institute here in Bangladesh, um, where we started looking at opportunities for how we can forecast um, conditions for the disease. 
um, and deploy advice and information to farmers rapidly in, in terms of a, an emergency response. And to do this, we, we reached out um, through a project called the Climate Services for Resilient Development Project that is also USAID supported. And we reached out to colleagues in Brazil who had started to work on this disease um, in Brazil where it, it had previously been a problem. And we worked with them on developing a, a pretty simple but elegant predictive model that integrates temperature forecasts, precipitation forecasts, relative humidity forecasts, and it drives a spore cloud development model and then basically indicates days um, when you're forecasting um, that might favor uh, a risk of infection by, by the disease. And that's all very good, and you can show that with a lot of data and graphs, as I'm showing here. Or you can also render that in very simple dashboard format with gridded information that indicates on a map where you might have uh, no risk versus moderate or high risks in, in advance of the disease occurring. And again, th this is also very, very useful and, and good. Um, and I should mention also we're working with the um, big data platform community of practice on crop modeling, which is also support supported work to integrate the DSAT crop model and couple it into this so we can actually give predictions of yield losses as well. Um, and that is under development. But we still need to get this information rapidly to farmers. And in order to do that, we're, we're sorting out at this point in time how we, how we want to do that. But what I want to say is that it's not straightforward. And I think the last two presentations were very valuable because they showed very clearly how you need to work with a large network of partners. One institute will not be sufficient. Um, and we have a short lead time with respect to being able to control the disease. So we need to be able to forecast accurate weather in specific locations have that information forecasted, um, ingested by models and represented, and then we need to push advisories and information to extension agents and to farmers really very quickly for them to be able to do something before disease actually strikes. And what you see here is sort of the ecosystem of partners that we're working on um, in Bangladesh with different climate service applications. And just for this simple activity, it involves coordination of amongst one, two, three, four, five, six, different partners if you include farmers as well to get information out. In terms of scaling, we're in a, in a lucky position where the Department of Agricultural Extension is about to purchase and supply more than 10,000 3G enabled tablets to extension services and lead farmers throughout the country. And that provides a platform for being able to get people to make use of this dashboard, but also to receive information quite quickly. There's been interest emerging from the private sector also on the application of um, these models and it, how it might be able to help guide smart fungicide use rather than, than necessarily overuse, uh, which I think is interesting because companies are interested in uh, avoiding moral hazard and actually deploying good information on when to make use of, of, of uh, fungicide rather than just being driven by sales and trying to see them applied all of the time. And we're also looking into interactive voice response options, which I'll talk about in the next slides, um, where um, farmers could receive a voice message call that explains the risk, and you can do that at, at scale and get information to people quickly. But this also requires a, awareness raising and tailored messaging um, for farmers to understand the relevance of forecasted information and, and actually disease information to act on it. Another activity that we've got ongoing, and this is with the support of the Blue Gold program in Bangladesh, um, focusing, in, focusing in the south of the country, we're doing some work on mung bean. And mung bean is a, a crop that's widely grown and has, is potentially very, very profitable, but is also very climate risk prone. Um, at the end of the mung bean season in Bangladesh, when farmers are picking the crops during this period, there's a high risk of having heavy rainfall events that can basically defoliate the crop or cause pods to shatter and drop off. And depending on the year, can cause very large um, crop losses um, as reported by farmers. And if you look also at the historical data, you see very often that you have these heavy rainfall events that are coinciding with when farmers are trying to actually mobilize labor and go out and pick their crop. 
So we developed a project to address this issue, and we wanted to keep it very, very simple. And the way that we're doing that is using uh, weather forecasting model outputs to, um, to trigger a threshold when we anticipate that there will be a heavy rainfall event that will potentially damage Mungbin. And we're looking now um, with partners at interactive voice responses uh, options for delivering an emergency alert to farmers. And farmers are quite aware of this risk in this particular area where we're piloting. But we're working basically to send the message that says, hello, this is an emergency message from the Department of Agricultural Extension and from the Meteorological Department. There's a high risk of a, a, a potentially crop damaging um, rainfall event that will occur in the next five days. Harvest your crop as quickly as possible before you lose the crop. And so that's the very simple work that we want to do, but I think can be very important given the large risk of losses. Now, in order to do this, um, a bit like our colleagues from ICRSAT showed, we didn't just run out with a, te with a product and attempt to apply it um, sort of from the computer or from the laboratory, if you will, directly with farmers. Um, we instead actually went out and have done quite a lot of work with focus groups, trying to understand how farmers wanted to receive information, what their preferences were for information, and we had interesting results. Um, farmers were not interested in having apps. Um, they were not interested in making use of them. Uh, they were not interested in receiving more SMS alerts. They found that to be bothersome because they get too many SMSs already in terms of advertising. And so there was a strong preference for direct voice calls, which I like, but it's not necessarily easily scalable to have an operator call individual farmers and give them an alert when there is an emergency. So instead, we're looking at this interactive voice response option. And this is sort of um, an outline of, of, of what we're working on putting together at this point in time. Um, again, targeting the large degree of mobile phone penetration in Bangladesh and that farmers are able to receive calls. Um, but if there is an alert that is triggered, it will go through a system that will deliver an automated message directly to farmers, giving an emergency alert about moderate level emergencies versus very severe ones that are anticipated. We plan to do a little bit of A-B testing with the system, which is interesting because you can push different wording of alert messages to farmers at a large scale and then look at who responds to which kind of message more. You can look at how long they listen to the message before hanging up or becoming bored, for example. And you can use that to iteratively tailor and improve the system as, as you go forward. Um, the other thing that I think is really relevant is that when you have phone bank information of whether farmers are, for example, women or men, you can start to tailor the information and package information for them um, that might speak more to their interests. And we address this in focus groups, but we found, for example, and this confirms literature that's been written on this, um, women, for example, women farmers will be very interested in receiving an emergency alert message around mung bean harvesting because they are indeed involved in mung bean harvesting and also drying of the mung bean crop. But they also indicated a preference for having additional information that is of valuable value also from a development standpoint, for example, on small messages on child health and nutrition um, or, or practices around child rearing and so on. And then you can package that information where you deliver an emergency alert, but also say, if you're interested in also learning about child health and nutrition, press number two. And there can be a recorded message that gives that information. And we're trying that out because we're, we're thinking that it might increase the value of the product while also um, directly responding to the information needs that were articulated by farmers when we did our focus groups. So um, I've got just another few slides, um, but I wanted to mention a new project that we are starting just now with the support of, of the CCAF's Climate Smart Agricultural Flagship. And I thought this one was relevant because when we think about digital extension, we should think not just about delivering information, but also collecting information and making use of it. And I think our colleagues from um, ICRSAT talking about Plantex spoke very well about that. But I think we're at a very interesting time in agronomic research. Um, we used to, as agronomists, for example, do field experiments that we went out and planted ourselves or perhaps did with farmers. 
where we would decide on a number of treatments, we'd manipulate them, we'd look at whether we confirm or reject our hypothesis, and so on. And that's sort of a top-down deductive way of doing research, or many people would call that the Karl Popper or Popperian approach to doing research. But now we're in a, a whole new world where we are able to conduct large-scale digital surveys using tablets at a scale that we were not able to um, do five or, or, or 10 years ago, where we can collect large amounts of information from farmers on their crop management practices. We can use data mining techniques to understand patterns in those practices. We can represent outcomes not just in terms of yield, but also indicators of climate smart agriculture. Um, we can integrate crop models and greenhouse gas emission models when we apply to the data that we, we collect. And we can use that information to do targeted and cost ex effective experimentation. But rather than have the researcher drive the agenda, I think that the world that we're moving into with respect to big data availability and collecting data from farmers allows us to completely transform how we do agronomic research, flip it on its head, and in, instead learn inductively from, uh, um, from the large amount of information that, that can be made available. And, and that includes not just survey data from farmers, but you can, co you can collect survey data, but you can also crowdsource data, for example, on markets through IVR systems. You can make use of remote sensing to look at NDVI uh, or predict water balance information. Uh, there's a lot of information becoming available on, on gridded um, climate data sets that are free of charge and can be downloaded and applied and, and used. There's a lot of uh, secondary and, ex and quite explicit gridded soil information that is available now. And if you take all of this information and stack it together, th what, what this project will do, will be looking at um, taking that information with data mining techniques to try to derive insights in productivity patterns and climate smart agricultural practice indicators that are coming from farmers' fields themselves as they apply them themselves. Again, this is research trying to learn from the cloud of information and from large databases of farmers and secondary information um, so we can look at what's actually happening in farmers' fields rather than agronomists driving things at, on an experimental research station. And what we hope to do with this is to develop dashboards so we can, in near real time, represent information on, on farmers' practices and how they're doing with respect to these indicators but also use the same approach to crowdsource information. So you can collect information initially from surveys, process that information, push recommendations to extension and to farmers with respect to how they can improve their practices. And for farmers, for example, who are willing to participate in simple IVR-based surveys, you can also collect information and feed it back into the whole system to try to improve it on an iterative basis. And this has some similarities to what Sheetal and colleagues were talking about with respect to the rice crop manager system, but we're going to start to look at doing this to make it um, very agile and, and cost effective in, in terms of an approach that not only provides information, but collects information, represents information, and shows it in a way that can be used practically for extension. So <clears throat> to conclude, um, just a few remarks. We were asked to think about the role of the CGIR in extension, and I think many scientists get nervous about the word extension and scaling in the CGIAR. Some scientists think, well, it's, it's not really our job. We develop technical products and extension needs to extend them or we have to hand them over. And that, I think, is an interesting approach. If, if you want to be a good scientist and really focus on what you're doing, that's appealing. Um, but I don't think that we're in a place and time when we can engage in that way anymore. I think that there's a strong need for developing research products that have scaling pathways and extension pathways embedded in, in the process from the beginning. So the science that we do is positioned so it can be made um, and, and, and put into use rapidly. And that's especially important with respect to agronomic technologies and approaches because getting them into use is quite more complicated, for example, than than a seed-based technology. At the same time with this digital extension, I think there's some risk of being overly technology-centric and assuming, for example, that farmers want to make use of apps or of computers and so on and so forth. 
Our experience has shown that farmers actually really want very, very simple information so they can take it and run with it and use it. Um, and I think that we shouldn't necessarily go out and say, well, this project will design an app rather than this project will design a process for developing information that can be extended to farmers. And perhaps an app is the right way to go about delivering it, or perhaps another approach is necessary. So I think digital extension needs to be very much needs-based. I think there's also interesting opportunities for this as an applied research field. Um, in addition to the work that our colleagues have presented with respect to tools that are actually being deployed, there's really interesting work that I think can be done largely from a social science perspective on the usefulness of digital extension and reaching farmers. And I think the lessons that we might get from that could be very useful in guiding these efforts. I also mentioned that old is gold. Um, beyond apps and, and algorithms, just doing films and showing them to farmers and answering questions has been a very useful format for us, at least in Bangladesh and with respect to Simit's work. And then finally, we're all still learning. This is a new area, and there's a crucial need for information sharing, collaboration, and synergies and improvements. So it's wonderful that webinars like this are happening to start facilitating that communication. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy. Thanks so much for your insights and also the conclusions and digital extension. I think that's a great segue into our question and answer session. We've had so many people on here talking um, and asking us questions. I'm going to turn over to Whiskey from the Community of Practice team who will be helping to facilitate these questions. Awesome, so while uh, Whiskey is getting set up, I can begin um, by looking through some of the questions that we've come across. Um, and all the, que the questions will be directed at all three speakers to begin with. So um, first of all, a huge thank you to everybody who is still with us, people who are still contributing um, and letting their thoughts be shared and known. To begin with, we have um, this question here from Mahesh um, Shandwar, who's been interacting with us throughout. And this is actually towards um, Rowena and Shitao. So the question is, um, are there lessons to be learned for the Philippines from the Indian experience and vice versa? So as Rowena and Shitao, as you were talking through the different experiences um, with rice research in the Philippines and in, the, in India, we're wondering if you could talk about some key takeaways in terms of the differences in the different local context as well. Okay, Shita, would you like to start? Um, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of key messages and some of them I would say have been uh, really covered by Tim in his last presentations. So the key message uh, which we would like to say is that when we look at the new technologies that we are developing, uh, we have to be aware about the environment where we want to take them to, uh, to look at the pros and cons before we move further with them, develop uh, effective partnerships. And I think that is the key that we are talking about. Because it's not only about one uh, institute or two institutes, it's the collaborative partnerships that will uh, bring out the difference and will be uh, will develop tools and services which are more sustainable uh, we should be very uh, very careful about the environment where we are working so uh, studies which tim was talking about are very critical and uh, whenever we do all these testings we do engage in the socio economic studies to understand the environment and to develop the tools accordingly. Yeah, with regard to the uh, Philippine experience, it's important to also know what uh, our partners want, what our partners need in terms of um, this kind of digital tools. Um, in the, um, oh, like I agree with with what Tim said, and I I heard it from. Um, our conversation yesterday with um, 
uh, Akim Doberman, uh, that um, we have to be very simple in our messages because farmers like simple messages. Um, in the case of RCM, the background of SSNM is a complex science. Um, we thought we made it really simple when we do the nutrient manager, rice crop manager, but then there's a lot of opportunities still um, to make it more simple to deliver the simple messages to farmers. Great, thank you so much, um, Rowena. Yes, definitely, as we're learning, it is important to fully understand and identify the needs of the context that you're working in and then tailor the solutions to those contexts um, in the example that you talked about. Um, so I'll ask Whiskey to join whenever she's ready um, and unmute herself on the Google Hangout just to make sure that she'll be able to connect and share the questions. Um, so Whiskey, we can't hear you currently. I think you might need to unmute on the Hangout itself. Fantastic. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Oh, great. First of all, I would really like to thank the three speakers that were, or the, the five speakers. Uh, they were really great presentations, uh, and it's very interesting for us to hear what they're doing in, in the other side of the world because we are usually a little bit more focused on uh, Latin America. So it's really, really nice to hear what's going on in Asia. Um, so uh, we are actually, um, could you maybe pull up the Mentimeter, Sadie? Because we would like to ask you some questions, the audience. Um, and we asked this a while ago to some, some other CGIR colleagues. What are the key challenges um, that you face? And um, so this is a system where you can log in and then you can vote. And during the time that you're voting, we can actually ask some of these things to, to, to the speakers. Um, is it working? Can you? Is she screen being shared? Yes, I believe we're going. Let me just double check. Um, yes, we should have one second. So the second question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it should be showing now. Yes. So um, if any of the, um, uh, uh, the, the presenters, but also the, the audience, if you can go to www.menti.com and then you use the code that is up there, 482929, you can vote on this question. And basically you kind of uh, rate how much these um, challenges are key challenges in your opinion for digital extension. So while we're having this, we will just continue with some some um, some other questions. Um, Daniel, you you had a question? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, um, I have a question more on on the on the on side of of cap capacity development because in one of the presentations uh, they they show that that that's kind of an issue. So I would like to ask. Uh, because there was that was something that I missed from the other presentation is like about um, the technical skills of the the technicians, not necessarily the farmers, but the technicians that are sub, that are the ones delivering the information. I mean, we we know from from Latin America that we struggle with that we, because we, we don't think that the technicians, the new generation of 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 agronomists, are have the skills to to read the graphs, to to read the actually the 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 um, outputs of 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 the of the different apps that we have developed or the different uh, technologies so I, I wanted to know more from 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 the different speakers about if they if, if they have struggled with the same issues in in asia so um ram or uh Shikran, maybe you can start with commenting on this yeah can i, Shikran, can yes. I just go first on that yes okay yeah. yeah uh generally you know um daniel i think uh, the 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 
the advantage of using digital tools is you know our latest visualization is the whole crux of you know a good ui ux is to simplify things right so if our end product in terms of a digital intervention does not really crystallize and simplify the information i think there is probably a design issue as far as the digital intervention is concerned because you know a good part of any app development i think even timothy has uh, has stressed it a good farmers aren't essentially looking for applications they are actually looking for solutions right so you need to really be very careful about your digital design in the sense that it it really does not become a burden but it actually simplifies the matter right so in in that context both the interventions we spoke about be it plantix or be it the isat are pretty much were designed with very strong user experience in mind so i'll just pause there maybe shrikant can add oh yeah uh, really ram actually beat has invested a lot of time and efforts to see look at the user interface and the experience in fact uh, some of the tests that we carried out in the field was uh, we requested some of the farmers and told them we are going to watch if they are downloading it for the first time actually where are they going and touching the screen and how much time did they take to actually open the app and use it so it was as uh, we were stunned actually that uh, in spite of the efforts uh, we need to build the capacities and actually focus on uh, re retraining them actually we were fortunate to a certain extent to train people two or three times for using a very simple app like plantix actually uh, the department had something called a video conference every two weeks they reached out to 6000 of their staff who were in front of uh, television sets that were connected in almost one of the states the whole state i mean 5000 people at a time we were retraining them revisiting them and telling them the same things this is with qualified technicians and extension staff so i understand um, in spite of that Uh, there will be calls and sometimes they give messages asking us to you know go back and they'll face very simple things of even setting setting using setting setting up their you know uh, camera and um, allowing settings like uh, gps location to be used by the app so uh, these these are the things that are really challenging and repeated uh, training should be done uh, the, the only thing is once we train i don't think anything will happen actually um if we if we are in the field we understand actually retraining is a must taking feedback on the quality of our own training is a biggest issue so we are trying to do that in some of the training programs actually what actually whether we could do a feedback right after the training program well i will uh, say something about uh, here in the philippines regarding the the, the policy environment because as of now um it, well i i mentioned it, uh, in the presentation that in the philippines our partnership is with the department of agriculture and regarding this um transition period we are working on really getting the department of agriculture be involved in all of the processes in the rice crop manager from the research to the development of um the hinchon trees and recommendations down to the deployment um process of the rcm in the in the ground or towards reaching the farmers um yes we do have the transition phase and yeah we're expecting that after the the transition and uh, after the full take over of the rice crop manager then it has to be the department of agriculture though of course on the side here is still uh, doing some assistance we just want to make sure that this uh, project becoming a program is really included in the budgeting or annual budgeting of the government for it to be sustainable and for it to be used continuously um by the by the farmers thank you so much for clarifying um so as the webinar is almost going to an end i'm going to give the microphone to daniel who will give a little bit of a wrap up of the webinar okay guys so if you see if we can we can take a look at uh, the results of mentimeter right so it seems like still uh, the adoption by farmers is the the, the biggest challenge right and you see, if you see the graph it's really skewed uh, to the right so it's it's for sure that that is the biggest challenge and and then 
uh, even though we have like very nice initiatives in, par in partnership with the private sector, seems like the finding finding a suitable business model is still is still a challenge. And and I mean this is also what I what I what I what we suspected from from this latitude here in Latin America. Um, I'm I mean in terms of, of the of the webinar, I think. Uh, Tim was right. I mean, when he was drawn, when he drawn his conclusions and said that it's not CGR, CGIR work to do the job of extension, that that's true, right? But I'm still very happy to see how we, our colleagues in different latitudes, they still manage to generate the partnerships, the right partnerships, not only go with government but also with private sector, with NGOs, in order to get this job done. Which I think, I mean. It's, we, we should be very, as CGIR, very proud of ourselves on the way how we've been doing. It is true that still adoption is a challenge, but it's, I mean, it's, this is not easy. I mean, this is, 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 we know that it's challenging because, as I said before, I mean, back to those days where I, where I used to work as a tension officer, to reach farmers is, is, not, is, is not easy. Um, I mean, I, I cannot avoid, avoid to, to talk about the, the, the puppy and proud I am to, to see that we also use in like, a, a range, a wide range of analytical techniques. I mean, from we use based models, but we also use deep learning and uh, decision trees. Like, uh, I mean, we we we're kind of doing the job as you know the private sector is doing. Like, we we we're, we're using the proper techniques. Um, we're creating the nice alliances. So we really hope that the, with this community of practice, I mean, we, we're just trying to facilitate this work, right? To facilitate this collective knowledge. And we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, what we were doing in a different um, geography. So so this is just a starting point of what we hope would be like a, a, a collaboration and to 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 take, to, to, to have like probably outside of the CGIR and, and do this much better. Awesome. Uh, I don't know. Would awesome. you have to say something? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, and also, just to um, wrap up, I would say, how can people contact um, the various speakers that are on right now? Because I do see that we have some questions that we may not have been able to get to because of time. Um, so, what's the best way to contact? I'll just ask each speaker to mention briefly how people can learn more and contact them as well. Um, so, Tim, I'll start with you. What's the best, best way for people to reach you if they have any further questions? Um, you can email me, and um, I can't share it right now, but um, my email is t.krupnik, K-R-U-P-N-I-K, at cgiar.org. I won't promise that I'll get back to you the same day, but I will get back to you. <laughs> awesome. And I do see that Shutel and Rowena have shared their email as well, so we'll make sure to share it with participants so that they can follow up if they have any further questions. Um, but yeah, at this right. point, I would like to say thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, we're sorry we run a bit over time. But um, again, we'll send the email as well as um, the presentations. Um, we'll check with our speakers for if we can share it and have people connect to us as well. So thanks all for joining in um, and looking forward to connecting shortly for our future webinars. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.